Hello, everyone, and welcome to the TMA Ask the Expert podcast series. Today's podcast is, is entitled Stem Cells as a Treatment for Rare Neuroimmune Disorders. My name is Gigi DeFibri, and I will be moderating this podcast. The TMA is a nonprofit focused on support, education, and research of rare neuroimmune disorders. You can learn more about us on our website at myelitis.org. This podcast is being recorded and will be made available on the TMA website for download via iTunes. During the call, if you have any additional questions, you can send a message through the chat option that's available with GoToWebinar. For today's podcast, we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Jaime Matola and Dr. Michael Levy. Dr. Jaime Matola is the director of the Progressive Multiple Sclerosis Multidisciplinary Clinic and Translational Research Program and an assistant professor in the Department of Neuroscience and Neurology at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center in Columbus, Ohio. Dr. Amatola received his medical degree from the University of Cartagena and completed his residency in neurology at Temple University Hospital and his postdoctoral training and fellowships at Harvard, Harvard Medical School. He is a multiple sclerosis neurologist, a neuroimmunologist, and some cell scientist. Dr. Amatola discovered the first molecular mechanism of migration of neural stem cells in a model of central nervous system injury. He has also pioneered research in immunology of neural stem cells. Dr. Michael Levy is an associate professor of neurology and the medical director of general neurology at the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. Dr. Levy specializes in taking care of patients with neuroimmunologic diseases, including multiple sclerosis, transverse myelitis, optic neuritis, and neuromyelitis optica. In the laboratory, Dr. Levy's research focus is on the development of neural stems for regenerative therapy in these diseases. He uses rat and mouse models to test the survival, differentiation, and functional capacity of human neural stem cells to improve neurologic function in post-inflammatory conditions. The goal of his laboratory and clinical effort is to translate the basic science stem cell work to a human trial in transverse myelitis and other neuroimmunologic diseases. Welcome and thank you both very much for joining us today. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so to start, before we get into uh, the questions, we did receive um, a lot of questions uh, about this very important topic. Um, I would first like to um, turn it over to Dr. Imatola to just kind of give us an overview about stem cells, um, what their characteristics are, and the different types of stem cells. Yep. Well, thank you very much for the invitation, and um, it's very, I'm very glad to be here talking to all of you. Um, this is an important uh, topic, and uh, what I'll do in the next four or five minutes is just to give you an, a, an overview of what these um, stem cells are. So stem cells are cells um, of the, that are present in the human body, and um, they have a kind of very typical properties. And we usually call it cells with a blank slate because they can do things and differentiate and, and, and other things. But these are very primordial cells. We start uh, our development when we are in uterus basically as a bunch of stem cells. So they, they have four different uh, characteristics or properties that make them very, very important for therapeutic uh, purposes. Number one is, is called self-renewal. This property is the ability of, of a stem cell to generate more cells like themselves and maintain that blueprint, that ability to be a blank slate. And, and this is a very important ability that we see in, you know, in our brain and in our uh, blood. Uh, we have stem cells uh, in different systems. We have it in the blood. We call it hematopoietic stem cells. They are uh, able to generate our blood, our red cells and white cells. We also have it in bone, uh, bone marrow. We also have it in the blood. They are uh, part of the the number of cells that are very rare population of cells, very, very rare, but they are there. Now, the other um, important characteristics is called differentiation. Differentiation means that these blank slates go and become, these cells become from the blank slate to be um, professional cells, more specialized cells. Meaning that if, he, 
if the cells are going to the brain, then they, uh, you know, they can have then the opportunity to become brain cells. And we have many different brain cells with different functions. And we get all these cells actually when we are, uh, you know, during our gestation and our, our, our development. So differentiation is very important because, um, you know, in, in many diseases, we have problems with that and we want cells that are able to differentiate. The other property that is crucial is called migration. Migration is that so these cells are able to go from one place to the other in the body or taking, um, you know, positions that are relevant for their function. And they do that because they have some uh, receptors uh, in the in the cells that actually kind of um, sense chemicals that are in the in the blood or in the brain, and they can basically go from one place to the other. So these are the the four of the three um, main um, capacities that you that you see in, in the stem cells. As I mentioned to you, uh, for the purposes of this conversation, I mean we have our bodies full of stem cells in many different areas. But recently, we have been able to generate cells from people, meaning that we can take an adult uh, cell, like a fibroblast in your skin, and we can then uh, take, the, take the cells and actually transform the cells using some uh, molecules into a cell with a blank slate. And we call this inducible pluripotent stem cell. That's a big or a mouthful. But it's actually a very important type of cell, meaning that now we don't need to use um, anybody's cells, but you can use your own in, in terms of uh, generating cells that are able or may be able to use as a therapy. So in, in conclusion, we have um, all these type of cells uh, in the body. Um, they have different properties, but they are, these are the fundamental things that we look for in a stem cells. Uh, for the purpose of therapy and the purpose of using it in the future. Okay, great. Thank you for that overview. Um, and Dr. Levy, do you mind you know, just adding to that or and also kind of framing that within, you know, rare neuroimmune disorders? Why, are, why do we talk about stem cells in, in rare neuroimmune disorders? Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, we talk about stem cell regeneration in neuroimmunological diseases because generally after an attack of transverse myelitis or an attack in the brain or the optic nerve, regeneration um, is limited and patients can make some recovery, but generally not a full recovery. And our thinking is that one of the best ways to improve function is to regenerate parts of those damaged areas. And our, our best hope to do that is with stem cells, either harnessing the endogenous stem cells that uh, Dr. Mottola was mentioning and, and, and inducing them to regenerate, or to transplant stem cells from outside, exogenous stem cells, and program them to regenerate lost tissue. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and so... You know, we've, as I said, we've received a lot of questions on this topic. Um, and first, you know, we've, uh, there have been several questions that kind of relate to the idea of a cure um, for something like transverse myelitis. Um, is, you know, is this, are stem cells, you know, what we would call a cure or how, you know, uh, you know, and how would something like stem cells affect symptom management or, or the symptoms someone has? Mike, is that for me, Gigi, or who, who's that for? Um, uh, whoever is, you know. Right. I mean, you can start, Mike. Yeah, so I, I, I tell patients that after an attack of transverse myelitis of the kind that does not recur, that basically the immune system ha has um, returned to baseline and that all of the symptoms left over are from the damage that was done. So in that sense, yes, the cure would be to regenerate and restore that lost function. And stem cells, again, are the best way that we think of, that we know of, to try to improve on that function. Great, thank you. And then how, um, Dr. Levy, how would this differ in someone with something like neuromyelitis optica? Yeah, you know, with a patient who has a chance of relapsing, who has another chance 
where the immune system is going to activate again and attack another part of the spinal cord or another part of the nervous system, then the treatment is not just to um, to deal with the damage that was done, as with transverse myelitis, but also to treat the immune system and target that to prevent any future attacks. Those are different types of treatments. Yeah, so I, I, I would say that, you know, in, in recurring disease, um, we have to be mindful that uh, actually stem cells can be targets of the disease process. So, I mean, if you, if you have, um, you, obviously you have to target the immune system and, and try to um, reduce the inflammation to actually in the future be able to think about how you go about injecting or implanting stem cells. So obviously, inflammation may have, in some instances, a, um, a good effect for migration of stem cells, but in, in some instances, it's actually deleterious, meaning that chronic inflammation can be bad. And so the, the prediction is that if you have, if you're not targeting the immune system and trying to tame the immune system, um, you pro probably your any kind of stem cells that you put there as they differentiate and they become part of the, um, the environment, normal environment, or, or the regenerative environment, they can be as well targeted um, because of the disease process. So you have to focus in both things, I guess, first inflammation and, and then uh, hopefully uh, some sort of regenerative strategy. Right, okay. Um, and then we did get questions about um, you know, I know none of these things are, you know, currently available treatments, but, you know, is the idea that something like stem cells um, would be able to help someone who is, um, you know, only someone that was newly diagnosed with something like transverse myelitis or, um, you know, someone who was five or, you know, multiple years out from a diagnosis? Um, Dr. Levy? That's an issue we've been debating internally for a long time. Whenever we have the opportunity to design a trial with stem cells, one of the questions is, what's the optimal window, what's the optimal uh, time for treatment? And in some cases, depending on the mechanism of the stem cells, we, we might um, you know, choose to only transplant patients who are very stable, where there's, the damage has been done and there's going to be no more change. And then uh, adding stem cells in that context can really inform us about any activity there. And in some cases, depending on the mechanism of the stem cells, we may want to intervene before any scar tissue develops to optimize the chance that the stem cells will work. And so in that case, that might be within the first six months of an attack. So I, I wouldn't say that there's any, um, you know, one design that works best. It really just depends on the, the mechanisms that we're thinking that the stem cells will have, will, will, um, will use in their regenerative capacity. Right. Okay. Um, and just kind of backing up, you know, before we go into more of these questions, um, you know, for something like monophasic transverse myelitis, where there was this one attack, um, and, uh, you know, as you said, Dr. Levy, kind of the damage there is done, um, you know, what is the state of stem cell therapies to restore these, um, you know, nerve pathways and function? Um, you know, is the treatment being used anywhere or is it in clinical trials or, you know, what, where, kind, where is it in, um, uh, you know, in terms of being used, uh, Dr. Levy? At last count, there were something like 25 worldwide clinical trials that involved transplantation of stem cells, either into the bloodstream or um, into the um, spinal cord or the spinal fluid. And these were worldwide. A lot of them in, in Asia and East Asia and South Asia and a few in Europe and in the U.S., uh, but they span different diseases like multiple sclerosis, traumatic spinal cord injury, and there is one trial in neuromyelitis optica. And, you know, anytime there's a new trial, I usually contact the investigators and I say, hey, is this spinal cord injury only limited to trauma um, induced, or are you considering also immune mediated spinal cord injury? And so far, most of them have tried to limit it to trauma to try to. Um, keep their study population homogenous. But I do think that we're going to learn a lot 
from all of these trials and many different diseases and be able to extrapolate from those results to our patients with transverse myelitis and, and rare immunologic diseases. So it's important to stay tuned and we're keeping our eye on all of these trials because if any of them have a, benef a benefit in their disease, and we can learn from that and then apply that to transverse my life. Right, okay, thank you. Um, and uh, Dr. Raymond, do you have anything to add about kind of the current state of research happening? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, I'm, I'm more, <laughs> um, more skeptical, um, you know, even though I spend 70% of my time in, in the research lab doing this um, and working on this, uh, so I think that um, we we have been doing stem cell transplantations for from research and translational research for almost 25 years or more. Um, so the the I mean tra neurotransplantation is kind of very old and being has been going on for for almost 100 years and last 40 years in Parkinson etc. So um, as, as, a, as an important topic to, of discussion, usually among internally among ourselves, is you know the, the, the issues of how we design uh, trials and how uh, what are the goals of the trial. So I mean, just as a reminder to the audience, um, you know there are clinical trials and they divide in different phases. And usually, when you're in the media and you're hearing about these things, usually the, you t you're you're told about phase one clinical trials that are basically to see whether or not you can, you have any complications about it, and then you escalate to other clinical trials. So the question is that we have a lot of trials going on, and we have to distinguish between what phase of the trial is. Many of these trials are are basically trials to see whether there is any complications related to the use of any kind of implantation of cells. And um, it's true uh, that it's happening, uh, but I mean, if, you, if we take a page from a stem cell thing in, for instance, cardiovascular diseases, heart attacks and things like that, we have seen the field turning into a very difficult field because we cannot follow what happens there. So we want to learn from those um, trials and other things that were there is not a clear pattern or a clear goal of treatment. So first question is, um, you know, if you have any therapy, uh, are you getting worse or you have any complications? Um, you know, the majority of these trials, the majority of cell therapy doesn't cause any harm to patients. But the reality is what is the um, success, meaning do you get improvement? How do you um, design the trial to, to, to obtain that data? And that's where the the difficult part is. So that's one thing that I want to say. So yeah, we wait for, we will wait for for trials in, in many different places. And the other is the distinction of I mean, like whether or not these uh, trials that are happening around the world are actually in research institutions or whether these are um, you know offered as therapy. And, and that's another different ball game. But it's actually very important that there are many places around the world that where patients patients are getting um, these clinical trials, but in fact, they are getting this as a, as a therapy. And this is the concept of stem cell tourism, where people go to Mexico and um, China and get some therapy. So we have to balance this and, and we have to make clear, um, you know, what exactly is that we're talking about in, in, in this particular area. Right, right. That's a good point. I mean, I, I do, uh, you know, we do receive a lot of questions from people about traveling um, outside of the U.S. and actually within the U.S. as well um, to receive, you know, stem cell treatments, they're called. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, uh, there. I know there's a lot of places out there. Um, so do you actually, Dr. Amatola, do you mind talking a little bit about kind of stem cell tourism and, and what the potential issues are with that? Yeah, so, um, it, yeah, so you know, it's, every patient with uh, transverse myelitis or neuromyelitis optica or, or bad MS, um, you know, we see them in clinic, and they always want hoping for a cure. We are also are hoping for cures, and we have you know different kinds of medications. But at the end of the day, as Dr. Uh, Livia alluded, I mean, when you get uh, this injury, 
you get a lot of symptoms and you can get a lot of disability. So, I mean, it's understandable that there is a great hope to get rid of that and move on with your life. So um, there is a concept called therapeutic hope. And that is, the concept is that patients are, they will do whatever they, I mean, they can to uh, help their family members or go anywhere they can to obtain the cure. And, uh, and that's a, a driving force um, uh, for, for stem cell tourism. And then in the other side of the, of the coin, there are these people um, that are offering many different kinds of things from injecting your your fat cells into your brain or your spine all the way to electromagnetic therapy you name it i mean we have a, a very big variety of things and and that is very significant because it's not harmless not only because i mean there, there is an issue of harm but also the issue of um exploitation patient exploitation so yes as our physicians were really interested in advancing the care and advancing the research, but there are probably probably other people that are maybe they are not in the same, they have the same interests and they are trying to take advantage of patients. Um, you know, and you can actually go to the web and find out uh, any kind of stem cell therapy for neuromyelitis optica, and you know, and and they will charge you a lot of money, and nobody knows whether or not that works. In, in your particular case. So there is a distinction between um, these things and uh, you know what we see in places, in, in big hospitals, like prospective clinical trials with stem cells. That's a big difference. Right, and is there is there a way to, you know, if someone is interested in um, participating in a trial or, uh, you know, they're looking for something to kind of figure out what these sort of more legitimate, you know, actual Perspective trials are versus something like a um, stem cell clinic. Yeah. So I mean, for instance, um, in my in my humble suggestion or opinion is that, for instance, if you, I mean, I don't know about neuromyelitis optica because I don't see as many patients as Dr. Levy, but he's an authority, he's a worldwide authority. In my case, in MS, I know what clinical trials are happening. So you have to find a trusted doctor of a reputable institution so you can ask these questions. Uh, so I, I I know that Dr. Libby has and get emails every week and phone calls and people asking him for where do I go for a clinical trial for for neuromyelitis optica. The same happens to me. I get at least three emails per day asking me the same questions, etc. So I think that you need to talk to people that are really invested and working in the field with a long track record of uh, having doing that or, or interested in patients. Uh, and I think that that would be my best advice for, for people in the audience that are looking for this. I mean, there, obviously there are people that, that they know about it, others that are, they are peripherally involved in research, but there are people that are actually working on it every single day. So I think that you have to do, you have to be your best advocate and ask an authority and email the authority or, or you know, or, or talk to their uh, clinical uh, people to see whether or not there is an opportunity for that. That right, would be the first right. one. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, and then going back, um, Dr. Levy, um, I know that you, uh, we did have one kind of follow-up question to um, when I asked about kind of what the current state of, of research is. Um, and you mentioned that there is one trial for NMO. Um, do you know a little bit more about that trial or, or where it's located and information about that? We have one question about that trial in particular. Yeah, the NMO trial is currently in China. I don't know my um, Chinese geography well enough to give more detail about it. I know that um, they they have they are in the process of um, publishing some of their data. I think interim data, and uh, I did get a look at that. I think it it is public information, or it will be soon, and it looks uh, potentially helpful, maybe uh, uh, because of its benefit on the immune system, because an NMO. You do have to target both the immune system and the nervous system. And so it did seem to have some benefits. Um, we'll have to see what the final data show, but um, I would remain hopeful. Um, yeah. Also, I would say that in, in a lot of these trials, you really have to wait for enough time to pass because in a lot of uh, transverse myelitis cases, if you treat too soon and then say, oh, look at how well these patients are doing, some of these patients are going to be recovering 
uh, partially anyway. And so it's hard to know how much of the recovery is due to the stem cells and how much is due to the other treatment or to just to time and rehab. So, um, you know, some, uh, I, I, I remain hopeful, but I would also remain um, just cautious about how these results are interpreted. Right, right. And that also goes back to, um, I think, what Dr. Amatola talked about um, in terms of figuring out the outcomes that are being measured um, to measure success in these trials as well. Um, and then um, you also you talked about how, you know, when you, you've reached out to different investigators who are um, doing stem cell trials in traumatic spinal cord um, injured uh, patients, um, we did have a question about, you know, if there are positive benefits seen in these traumatic spinal cord injury trials, um, will we have to do additional trials to apply these benefits to non-traumatic spinal cord injuries like with someone with transverse myelitis? Um, or, uh, you know, how, how would that work? Almost certainly, yes. The presumption is that traumatic spinal cord injury and inflammatory spinal cord injury have different mechanisms. So different things are damaged in the spinal cord, and maybe the stem cells will be helpful in one condition and not the other. Um, but it also depends on, you know, what's what the outcomes are. Uh, are. So, for example, um, when we do studies in um, traumatic spinal cord injury in animals, we have the benefit of looking at the pathology and saying, okay, the stem cells turned into, you know, whatever kind of cells, and they helped remyelinate. And so that property would also be useful in um, inflammatory transverse myelitis, the fact that they could remyelinate. So this is in, in animals, and uh, I'm just um, giving an example of the kind of analysis that would be helpful to extrapolate to inflammatory spinal cord injury. Now, in, in traumatic spinal cord injury trials, we won't have the benefit of sacrificing human patients to see what kind of mechanisms are at play. Um, but there are MRI and other indicators that may be helpful. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, and uh, we also got a question about, you know, are there, uh, there's, you know, are there specific stem cells that are expected to have the best kind of therapeutic outcome um, in these disorders, Dr. Imatola? Yeah. So I mean, that's a great question because. Um, you know, we, we struggle uh, in the field of stem cells, and every year we have this International Stem Cell Research Symposium, and we get like 35,000 people around the world thinking about these issues. And, I mean, the, the, the stem cells, different stem cells may have different um, possibilities. For instance, um, the, the famous um, pluripotent stem cells, I mean, the cells that are very, very naive and um, very uh, embryonic. They they have the tendency when they are culture in in vitro or expanded to actually acquire a bunch of different uh, aberrations, genetic aberrations in vitro. So certainly you don't want to put those in a patient's spine. Um, in addition, we have seen from actually data from the spinal cord injury that depending of, um, so there, there are occasions where um, stem cells may start actually integrating normally, but there are other uh, cells or cell lines that are that they cannot stop proliferating. So, I mean, one of the things that, as I mentioned in the beginning, is that you want, hopefully, that when you put, let's say, 50,000 cells, that these cells, they become immediately something differentiated, and they are they will start to uh, you know to go to become neurons or astrocytes the cells that you need the cells that are actually altered. But if the cells cannot stop proliferating, then you have a problem because you you basically have a unstoppable proliferation and probably you have a significant issue there that you need. So um, taking data from mouse model again, um, we have learned that. If you um, differentiate these cells forward into, um, you know, more mature cells, like for instance, we call it interneurons, or there are there are neurons that are able to function in the spinal cord. Some people now are doing clinical trials using um, more mature kind of specialized neurons that are progenitors that are still, um, you know, undeveloped or completely 
develop, but these progenitor cells tend to immediately, as soon as you put it on, on the tissue, stop proliferating. So there are actually two or three very nice uh, pieces of data. For instance, in a mouse model of, of, uh, of a bladder dysfunction that is very you know, uh, important in patients with uh, either transverse malaria or MS, they implanted in mouse, they implanted these uh, interneurons or neurons, and they saw um, some effectiveness there. So the idea is that, you know, um, depending on what um, pathology you're talking about, perhaps there will be a possibility to narrow down the specific type cells that you, you might need. For instance, in the case of uh, MS and, and perhaps demyelinating disorders, you want more uh, oligoprogenitor cells, meaning the cells that will become oligodendrocytes. So, but all of these require cell culture and manipulation in vitro. So we, we are a, a very long way to um, provide, um, you know, um, a complete, complete um, clean um, culture that uh, doesn't allow the cells to, to kind of get um, genetic variations. So it's a long, long explanation, but I think that this is a very important question that we need to entertain. Now, there are other people that says, well, you know, if you want to tame the immune system, perhaps you use some of these mesenchymal stem cells, et cetera. But again, uh, you know, we already have uh, powerful immunomodulators. So the question is whether you want that infusion of cells that will have a very narrow um, therapeutic effect only in the immune system. So that's, that's an open question. Right, right. And, you know, relatedly, do we, do we have any advances in kind of understanding how these cells would affect something like the immune aspect of these um, disorders or, you know, the formation of scar tissue or, you know, how cells migrate? Yeah, so, yeah, we do. I mean, um, for instance, um, there is an Italian group uh, in 2010 published this very nice work suggesting that um, um, surprisingly, some of the stem cells preparation, actually, they have this powerful immunosuppressor effect in animal models. We um, also participated in this research, and we demonstrated that, yes, indeed, um, some even neural stem cells can modulate the immune system, um, and they do it through, actually, some products that they, they produce. We call it cytokines, and we, there is a famous cytokine called LIF, or leukemia inhibitor factor, that is released by um, stem cells that actually have a powerful effect in taming this, the immune system. So you can argue that, you know, if you don't want the cells, you probably have, uh, you, can, you can deliver that potential cytokine in, in some patients. So I think that the stem cells can be helpful as well to learn more about how to use uh, or develop new therapies that can maintain the immune system. So yes, we, we're learning a lot about how the interaction between the stem cells and the environment. Gigi, can I add one thing about that? Yeah, yeah. We had a conversation yeah. recently with the FDA about a, a stem cell trial, and their concern was that the stem cells that we would transplant could trigger the immune system to attack again. Mm -hmm. So even in patients who've only had a single attack years ago, they were concerned that if we put in a foreign substance into their spinal cord, exogenous stem cells that came from, you know, some cultured preparation, that it could uh, be sufficient to trigger another attack of transverse myelitis in the same location, but it could cause more damage. Yeah. And so they asked us to look for evidence of an immune reaction, a previous immune reaction to these stem cells. And we did that by looking in the blood of these of patients with transverse myelitis for antibodies against stem cells as sort of a, um, a precondition to see if their um, immune systems could potentially reject the stem cells or cause any new damage. And to our surprise, we found that about 12% of patients have antibodies against these stem cells. Wow. It was a little higher than we, than we predicted. We don't know for sure that those antibodies would be harmful mm -hmm. or that planting stem cells would be harmful and trigger another attack, but it did give us pause to think this through more carefully. Yeah. So, and, and this is a, it's a wonderful example of, you know, going back to the bench, 
to answer this question. And I, I am happy that the FDA asked that question because, I mean, it's a fundamental question, right? For instance, uh, my first paper that I published actually asked the question, that particular question um, when I was in Boston. I mean, whether or not cells were able to in, in generate immune uh, reaction themselves, and, and they have, in certain circumstances, that ability. So it's not surprising to me that you get uh, that particular result. So, uh, but, but that is strength, um, the, the translational aspect of the work that we do. And for some patients, I mean, this is too slow. But you know, we need to do the the ABCs, and and before we we can move on, right? So imagine that we trans transplant a patient, and they have this reaction. So a, you're not going to get any benefit, but b, you're going to elicit a new inflammation. So it's good to know uh, that from the get go. Right, and it seems like it's important too to understand the disease process of why these antibodies occur, what or um, you know, as well. Um, and um, let's see. Um, we also, you know, got a question about, um, you know, is is there variation within different transverse myelitis patients or patients with neuromyelitis optica that um, you would foresee the need to have different stem cell types for different people? Either Dr. Lieber or Dr. Imitol. Um, yeah, I, I would say that in the future, we'll be able to tailor the stem cell product to the uh, pathology of the patient. So some transverse myelitis patients have mostly a demyelinating picture where the, the missing uh, component is myelin. And so that's what we need to regenerate. Whereas other patients may have um, loss of other tissues like neurons, and we may want to regenerate those. So I do think that there won't be a one-size-fits-all necessarily, but hopefully more of a tailored stem cell product. Right. And are there ways to determine, uh, you know, whether an individual has kind of primarily demyelination versus loss of neurons, or are we not there yet? We're close. We, we recently used an electrophysiology study to probe that question and, and try to discern a pathology that, dif that differentiates between demyelinating and loss of neurons. And we, th we think we're getting closer to do that. Um, biopsy would really be the definitive answer, but we don't want to biopsy people's spinal cords if we don't have to. But I think we are getting closer with different studies, like I said, electrophysiology and maybe even MR MRI techniques in the future. Yep. Right, right. Okay. Um, and then we, we have gotten a fair number of questions about individuals using their own stem cells. So I'm just going to read a few of um, the questions we got because they're all kind of related. Um, you know, so some, someone stored stem cells from their granddaughter's cord. Are these suitable for using with transverse myelitis? Someone else's son was diagnosed with TM um, and they have his stem cells banked from birth. Um, you know, when the, but then they read that having your own cells does not provide any additional benefit. You know, is this true? Um, and then someone else also has a daughter with transverse myelitis is saving her cord blood and banking it to be beneficial for her future. Um, so is there any kind of research on that or, or um, recommendations about storing someone's own stem cells? Yeah, so, I mean, I, this is a, a question that I have repeatedly in my clinic. And, uh, you know, I mean, we have to remind um, our patients that at this moment, we are doing research with stem cells. And, um, I mean, we are not uh, um, suggesting that they have to save uh, the granddaughter umbilical cord stem cells or anything like that, even though there is this, you know, this hope that we can do that. But, I mean, I think that a future therapy with stem cells probably will come from patients on stem cells rather than saving somebody else's stem cells. Because we, we now know and we can generate these cells from the same patient, right? We don't need to use, uh, as I mentioned Dr. Levy uh, a moment ago, um, the, the immunological issues in, in stem cells are not trivial. And uh, if you have a, a allogeneic, meaning somebody else's stem cells, um, Sometimes, I mean, it's not clear, but sometimes you might need to put this patient in some sort of immunosuppressor 
uh, depending on whether or not you have a reaction. So uh, what I say to my patients that uh, ask the question or saving cells, you know, I, at this moment, there is no utility to do that. I mean, um, I will tell you that if I, if we have in, in five, 10 years, uh, the answer, uh, by the way, those stem cells, they are saved um, for many years. A, I mean, you have to be very, very well characterized. And sometimes um, the umbilical cord stem cells may not have the same capacity that other cells. That also incurs in cost. There are actually, so it's very interesting, the, this opportunity to create business models for people. And the, there are people that, you know, they are not very ethical and say, well, you know, uh, we will save your cells for, and we will just do it. And we will charge you X amount of money. Uh, next thing you know is that they, they are not really safe. They are not, um, preserved. So there, there, there is a lot of potential for abuse here. So my suggestion is that, you know, really there is no need for that at this moment. Uh, I know that there is a, a great impetus to think that that's a potential benefit, but I don't think that there is any, any reason to believe that uh, any other cells but yourself, but your own cells, are going to cure your own uh, trans transverse myelitis in the future. Right. Thank you. Um, and then, uh, are there what what are the side effects or potential negative issue, you know, potential negative things that might happen um, in something like a stem cell trial? What what are um, researchers looking for? Um, you know, why can why do these safety trials have to happen first? What what are the potential things that might happen um, in as side effects in these trials, Dr. Levy? I'd say the top three things uh, that worry regulators. Number one would be growth of tumor cells. So we keep these cells alive in a dish and they may accrue some mutations that help them stay alive and maybe they don't have all the same um, pathways that are required for normal cell turnover and so that can lead to tumor growth. So that would be the first thing. There are um, newspaper articles about a, a transplant case um, in Russia, where uh, a child who uh, went to a stem cell clinic there ended up with tumors up and down the spinal cord. And so that that is a real risk. Um, it, it's not likely to happen in most cases, but it's something that, that's kind of worst case scenario. The other two things, one would be um, changing the blood flow. So if if these cells somehow change blood flow patterns, either blood in or blood out of the spinal cord, that could be devastating. And then the third is is sort of the, just the immune reaction to it. Do the immune cells come in and cause more damage? Do the immune cells come in and remove your stem cells? And after all that effort, uh, your immune system just comes in and removes it um, with no additional damage, but with loss of that benefit. So those are all the safety issues that I can think of maybe also the obvious infection risks. Uh, Jaime, do you have any, any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that the, uh, the, the, the most, um, I agree with you 100%, the most uh, relevant one per perhaps would be the concept of where your cells are coming from. So um, we, um, we, are, um, we have a paper submitted where um, we, we discussed this. I mean, we, we, there is this idea that, you know, if you have, um, stem cells from various sources, I mean, from Russia and other countries where there is no a, a strict protocol follow. I mean, um, they, they, these cells are called neurospheres, and we have more than 20 year growing neurospheres in vitro. And, and I agree with Dr. Libby, you have to be extremely careful how you grow these cells. Um, if you don't know what's going on, you actually induce this potential for, for transformation in vitro and you don't want those cells in vivo uh, in your spine. Um, uh, there are several cases that we now know, uh, in addition to the paper that you referred, the Amariglio paper in 2009, there is a, a paper in the Union Journal of Medicine uh, of a gentleman uh, that is actually uh, had a spinal cord injury getting a, a treatment from Mexico and China. Uh, he incurred into like $150,000 in costs and uh, he had a tumor, um, and there is a new name for these kind of tumors. Uh, uh, we call it glio 
proliferative tumor uh, after stem cell treatment. It's a, it's, a, it's a mouthful, but it's interesting because it's not a real brain tumor, but it's, 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 a, it's a more different, weird tumor that we don't know and we don't we we haven't characterized. So this is an important thing because um, the question is if, if if patients are presenting with this, what do you do with them? How do you care for them? That creates an additional problem. So um, a group of us are asking for a repository of actually uh, of um, adverse events for uh, all kinds of uh, stem cell implantations. I think that we will learn actually more from these things if they happen in the future. Uh, I mean, we are transparent and, and we disclose, obviously, the, the fact that this happens, but we think that we need to uh, you know, we need to know where the cells are coming from and how they are grown in culture. Right. And if someone, you know, decided to to go somewhere for stem cell tourism and then had kind of this some sort of negative effect, I mean, would that, you know, potentially make them ineligible for trials in the future? Or um, does, does that have any sort of effect on, on that? Yeah, I mean, we don't know. I mean, if you get a, a a a cell that nobody knows where exactly, what kind of cell, or for instance, one of the key issues in that particular case that Dr. Olivi alluded was the lack of documentation. So the cells were generated uh, in Russia. Um, the kid was transplanted in Israel, and um, and then uh, nobody knew exactly what what. what was the origin of the cells. I mean, they talk about a remote paper that the paper didn't actually explain the cells, how do they culture the cells. We, um, since I'm interested in this subject, um, we kind of investigated with the published literature and we found that there's not really documentation of that particular cell uh, in, in, in the literature or anywhere. So we don't know what really happened, how, I mean, we know that he got some these neurospheres in the back but we don't know uh, how they will culture, et cetera. So yes, that's an important uh, aspect. That will disqualify you for any particular trial. Right, right. Um, and then um, Dr. Levy, I have a question that came in specifically for you, um, that there is a, a, an infused medication that's currently in clinical trials for remyelination in MS patients. Um, I don't know if you know a little bit about this and if, if you do, you know, the, if this treatment will potentially be something that could be used in TM or NMO or with spinal cord injuries. Yeah, there are two trials that were recently completed, and one will go forward with the next phase for um, using these uh, molecules to stimulate remyelination. So these aren't stem cell trials. These are medications that are intended to remyel help the patient remyelinate. And they're being tested in MS. One is called Antilingo. And that one, uh, the way they describe it is basically removing the breaks. Because after a optic neuritis or transverse myelitis, there are certain cells that uh, put the breaks on the healing process in order to, well, we think, to um, prevent any further injury. And so this drug kind of removes those breaks and allows more healing to occur. And it looked very promising on their phase two study in multiple sclerosis, and the latest news is that they are launching a phase three study in MS, which absolutely would be useful in transverse myelitis patients um, who have a, a demyelinating picture. The other drug is um, manufactured by a company called Accorda, and their product is an antibody called uh, recombinant human IgM22. The short name is RIGM22. And they're in their second phase one safety study in chronic uh, MS. So these are patients who've had stable disability and they're looking for an improvement in neurological function. Th this antibody is thought to work by stimulating the um, proliferation of cells that make myelin in the spinal cord. Uh, it was discovered in a, in a patient actually who had uh, an amazing capacity to regenerate on her own, and these were isolated as as the factor that helped her do that, and now they're manufacturing it as a drug. So this would also be useful in transverse myelitis, and it's important, again, to keep an eye on both of these trials. 
uh, we most of the time in rare diseases, we first extrapolate from trials in common diseases, and we use many off-label products. So this is exactly how uh, the direction of the f normal flow of information. Right. Okay. Um, and then, if someone um, you know was to participate in in a stem cell trial, um, you know, is there is the idea that that you know, the, the stem cell treatment would be enough to kind of repair um, the damage or um, are, do these trials include things like aggressive rehabilitation? Dr. Levy? Um, we think that they'll probably include rehabilitation at first because as a safety study, we want to try to um, encourage enrollment and um, and not subject a patient to anything that would uh, cause further harm. So we'll probably pair it with rehab. Most of the regener uh, regeneration and rehab studies using devices pair their product with rehab. It's the standard of care, and we don't want to deprive patients of that opportunity. But then as, as these trials move forward, and we really have to be rigorous about knowing whether or not uh, the stem cells themselves are responsible for a benefit, then we'll have to try to isolate out that benefit as best as we can, and that would usually uh, require a placebo arm and a homogenous population and also a single therapy so that we're not confounding our outcomes. Right, and would that be, you know, as you said, that you, you know, rehab is kind of the standard of care in that sort of uh, scenario, would that just be with people who have, you know, had a diagnosis several years ago rather than someone who was just diagnosed, or would that sort of trial occur in recently diagnosed people as well? It, it could be in, in either population, just depends on the mechanism of the stem cells. Right. Um, and then, um, Dr. Matola, we've talked a little bit about, um, you know, participating in in trials, and we've we've gotten um, a lot of questions about kind of affordability of treatments, um, and so you know if someone is, wants to participate in a clinical trial, um, you know, do they have to pay to participate? Is you know is is volunteering the you know just uh, if you talk a little bit about kind of how you know someone could participate and what would be required of of them in terms of the financial commitment, and then. Um, if this, if stem cell treatment kind of became the norm, how that would, um, you know, affect insurance and stuff. Uh, okay. So, I mean, um, I, I think that it's important to express that ethically, um, there shouldn't be a quid pro quo or any kind of um, uh, ethical issues for patients to be part of clinical trials, meaning that, you know, they have to pay for participation in clinical trials. I mean, when we do clinical trials here, um, uh, I, mean, I mean, the patients don't pay, we pay them to participate if that's allowed by the IRB, et cetera. Um, they probably have to pay for transportation, but um, I don't think that, I mean, I, I understand in this particular field in different places, there have been some concerns about some places and people, uh, you know, uh, requesting upfront um, monetary contributions so the patients can participate because uh, they have to, you know, pay for for all the all the processes. But that's what we write grants and we obtain grants from institutions like the NIH and other institutions so they can they can uh, you know uh, fund the entire operation. So we don't have to ask people for paying or any of that. For instance, uh, just to give an example, there is a trial that uh, we are involved is a hematopoietic stem cell trial. Um, and uh, I mean, we have participated here and uh, the patients, you know, they come and they they get, uh, well, they got in the, several years ago, um, the bone marrow stem cells in MS and, you know, they, they don't have to pay for the for the trial, so I don't think that's a great idea because I mean that puts um, a lot of pressure in people. Um, in the same idea, um, um, many other institutions, even outside the United States, doing clinical research that is not IRB approved, are actually 
um, getting the interest to participate in these things and bring patients from the United States to do, for instance, bone marrow transplant in MS. Um, and the, patients have, the patient has to pay for the travel and stay, and there is a monetary uh, benefit for the, for the hospital. So I think that this, this goes into this very fine line of ethical behavior in, in clinical research. So in principle, I don't think that people have to pay for the participation. That's what we do, the, the writing of grants, so we can, um, you know, we can support that. Um, and when this becomes, um, hopefully, a medicine, we have to actually prove that the medicine, uh, or, I mean, the stem cells are um, equal or having the same benefit of a standard of care. And, you know, in case of MS, we we have uh, prospectively there is a trial that will we comp we will compare uh, bone marrow stem cells versus um, any other uh, infusion therapy and it will take some years I would say probably the three or four years to know the answer of that but I I think that we have to be just cautious and hopefully obtain good data because you don't want to you don't want to uh, you know uh, say that this is going to be helpful, and at the end of the day, there is no really benefit for the patients. Right, right, that makes sense. Um, and then, Dr. Levy, you talked a little bit about the remyelinating um, trials, and kind of, um, if you could just talk a little bit about the difference between something like a stem cell therapy and just a cell therapy, if that makes sense, because um, we have gotten some questions about the upcoming um, Q Therapeutics trial. Um, so if you could just talk a little bit about that. Sure. Cell therapy usually refers to using a cell to accomplish a task. So there are a lot of cell therapies now being developed that can seek out uh, cancer cells, for example, and then those cells help eradicate the cancer cells. Or there are other cells that are being used to produce proteins and other factors that are helpful. So you're using cells to accomplish a task that we used to accomplish with drugs. That's cell therapy broadly. Stem cell therapy narrowed in is more of using cells that are in a uh, de in a um, de-differentiated state, uh, an earlier state in in, in development using those kind of cells to try to regenerate um, some sort of lost function. So they're a little bit different in terms of how we use those terms, but stem cells generally refers to um, the type of therapy that we've been talking about today, whereas cell therapy has many broader uses and not necessarily regenerative. Right, okay, that makes sense. Um, and we, we only have a few more minutes left. Um, I did want to also ask Dr. Levy a, a little bit about, um, you know, what are some of the indicators that, um, you know, would be used to kind of measure the success of stem cell therapy? Would it be um, things like uh, motor function or uh, bladder and bowel dysfunction, um, issues like pain, or, you know, what, what kind of outcomes um, would researchers be looking at in these trials? That really depends on um, how we design the trial. Like um, in the beginning, I think most patients are going to be transplanted in um, in or below the level of their previous attack, and so that's designed to restrict restrict any further damage to just that part of the spinal cord that may not be necessary. So the outcomes are going to be really for safety. They're going to be hopefully nothing went wrong nothing got worse. Then as we move on, um, I think most outcomes are going to be tailored to the problem. So patients who have sensory loss, they're going to be evaluated based on their uh, ability to, uh, to feel things. Patients who have motor loss, they're going to be evaluated on their ability to move things. So I think it's going to be oriented to the loss of function of the uh, specific case. And that'll include bowel and bladder function as well. Right, okay. Um, and so we are you know, at, at the end of our time. Um, is there any other additional um, points either of you would like to make that we kind of haven't covered in this hour? Yeah, I guess uh, the, uh, the most important point is the issue of, of, 
be careful and, and obtain uh, appropriate information about uh, stem cells from a um, provider that is experienced in neurology and participated in, in clinical trials of that nature, uh, rather than just going to the web and find, uh, you know, uh, the first clinic that is there and, um, and, and then go and pay thousands of dollars in, in things that who knows what you're going to get out of it. Avoid stem cell tourism, that's the point. Right. Okay. Well, thank you both um, very much for your time. We really appreciate it. Um, we got through a lot of questions. Um, and I just wanted to remind everyone listening uh, that uh, this uh, podcast will be made available on our website um, and via iTunes for download. So if you missed any part of it, um, you can download it on our website. So thank you both so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.